thanks everybody uh, for this opportunity to talk about uh, a project uh, that I'm working on called OpenWorm. Back in the early days of open source development in the 90s, not really all that long ago, but um, a uh, essay, an influential essay was written uh, observing how open source code development was being done at the time. There were basically two camps. The first was characterized as a cathedral. In this camp, people were developing code amongst a closed group and putting that source code out into the public on regular intervals. But largely, the community of people building the code was more closed. A second group uh, was characterized as having a more distributed model. Uh, this was characterized as a bazaar. And in this model, the users could also be developers um, of, uh, of the source code. And this was, in fact, the way that Linux had been operating for some time. And uh, the essay was trying to try to figure out what was the difference in, in the models between these two. And so the essay was called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And uh, the main difference between the two, as the essay talks about, is the difference between sort of a, a closed or sort of hierarchical top-down approach to developing code versus a more distributed, decentralized version where every line of code was, in fact, exposed to the public as it was being created, as it was being written. Well, um, Linux ended up being pretty popular. If you have an Android phone, you're running it uh, in your pocket. Um, and it's uh, installed on about 1% of everybody's computer in the whole world. Uh, so, um, so a lot. And um, so I think it bears looking at for uh, this field as well and what we can take away from it. So um, the author of that essay, Eric S. Raymond, observed that in the source code community, um, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And I would posit perhaps for us uh, in this community, that potentially, with enough eyes, all of uh, complexity of uh, biology, maybe, is shallow. Or at least that's the attempt uh, and the context in which uh, I've undertaken some of the work that I've been doing and I'll talk to you about today. So really, um, what we've endeavored to do is to create people-powered uh, computational uh, biology with a project that, I'm, uh, that uh, we call OpenWorm. So what is OpenWorm? So um, uh, what I'll talk to you about today is structured in basically three parts. Um, we'll talk about computational biology and uh, informatics. Um, we will talk about uh, open science and social media, the approach that we're using there. And we will talk about using uh, best practices in uh, open source software engineering. OK. So. The project OpenWorm, its, its long-term goal is to create a digital simulation of the organism C. elegans from a cell-by-cell -cell, uh, manner up to behavior. Now, uh, on the one hand, uh, some folks think this is either terribly uninteresting or terribly overcomplicated, depending on who you are. So uh, let me um, walk through a little bit of the points of, um, of that by way of introduction to the C. elegans itself. So the first thing is its behavior. So the C. elegans actually does have uh, some interesting behaviors uh, for such a small organism. Uh, it is microscopic. It's about as long as a hair on your head is wide. But it does things like search for mates. It avoids predators rather deftly. Um, it uh, has social behaviors. It actually knows other worms and, uh, and groups up with them. Um, but I think some of the strengths of it for biology is that uh, it's the first organism uh, that we had a complete uh, sequence of its genome. Uh, that's one of its claims to fame. And we know a lot about its cellular anatomy as well. So we know every cell division um, from a single egg out to uh, the full adult. And uh, it has a nice property called utile, which is that this is conserved amongst all individuals that have the wild type, um, that have the wild type genome. Uh, and uh, for the purposes of, of neuroscience, we know that it has exactly 302 uh, neurons, 95 muscle cells, body wall muscle cells, and a total of 959 cells in its, in its body. And it's very, very well conserved. Um, so from this perspective, um, it's actually rather appealing. And then as well for neuroscience, um, it is the only full organism connectome uh, that we have to date uh, down at the, at the EM level. And uh, Mitra Chislavsky, who you heard from yesterday, has actually been involved in uh, pushing that, uh, that connectome further. So it is, it is a continual improvement and work in progress. All right. So that, we had to break down that big task into something a little bit shorter in the medium term. And, and it happened to be more relevant to, to neuroscience. So in the medium term, our goal is to reproduce a specific database of behavior um, with uh, a, a three-dimensional neuromechanical model of the C. elegans. And this will be the, the part where I talk about that. Um, so here's uh, what this guy looks like 
Okay, so there's a C. elegans under a microscope, uh, happily crawling around in a uh, auger dish, and uh, superimposed on top of uh, it is um, a outline that comes from uh, a computer vision algorithm being run on it, and this is actually used to get a very precise description of its behavior, which is very useful, because um, we can actually mathematically decompose and break down the behavior of the C. elegans into uh, things like principal components. So uh, researchers have found that approximately four uh, principal components, or eigenworms, I love that, uh, <laughs> Four eigenworms can describe 90% of the variability of, of the C. elegans movement um, under, under these conditions. Um, so that's really nice because it gives us the ability um, for a modeling project like this to build um, a behavioral classifier. Um, and, and actually this has been done in, in some follow-up work where they can actually determine, uh, they can actually detect the difference between a wild type and any mutant uh, C. elegans uh, just based on the statistics of its movement. And that's really important because that means that um, we can use that as well uh, for the purposes of determining if we were to have a simulated worm, does it act like the wild type, does it act like a mutant, does it act like none of the above. So that's a really nice constraint. And so our approach that we've been undertaking, and a lot of this really and I'm going to show you today is really about infrastructure building um, and, and laying out the stage for this. We're still in the process of, of, of going through this process. But um, uh, this is a very nice constraint for us to be able to take essentially snapshots of a simulated worm, feed it into a classifier like this, and then give ourselves a metric that we can use so we always know if we're doing better, if we're getting closer to simulating or not. Um, so this is a very nice feature. Okay, um, so I said that this is a cell by cell uh, description, and so in a very crude model of uh, you know of, of the way the nervous system works, a very crude feed forward model, we know that uh, we have a, a flow from sensory neurons to motor neurons that eventually impact muscles, and of course the whole nervous system is in service of creating motor behavior, and uh, that impacts a body, which then impacts um, you know the bounces around in a world and uh, then ultimately results in sensory feedback that comes back in. And so it's very tantalizing for an organism of this size and that we understand as well as we do to try and close this loop, um, all in simulation for the purposes of uh, understanding not just if the behavior uh, of, of some squiggles looks like behaviors of squiggles a real thing, but if in fact um, the cells are doing approximately what uh, they should be doing in this scenario. So um, we've presented in the past uh, work on reproducing the C. elegans uh, nervous system uh, in silico. So, um, so we've, we've had some posters on this before, but basically this is showing here a walkthrough of combining the cellular anatomy of uh, the neurons in their, uh, in, in situ, in their positions within, within the anatomy of the worm uh, with its connectivity, um, some uh, knowledge about neurotransmitters, and doing all of this using NeuroML, an open language, posting it up all online, and then this is actually even available that, to click through. This, uh, and this uh, movie here is drawn from an online uh, site, uh, Open Source Brave open source brain where you can actually go through and click as well and, and see this. So we have the starts of a nervous system, certainly not finished, certainly not complete. We don't claim that it's, it's yet operating or functioning uh, as well as we'd like it to, but it's, um, it's a place for uh, the bizarre to take over. Now frequently um, one of the concerns or criticisms about C. elegans uh, uh, neuroscience is that it's been hard to do electrophysiology and that has been true classically, but uh, recently with advances in optical imaging and shown here is some, some calcium imaging of a neuron in the head of the, of the worm, uh, we're getting a lot better at being able to see the dynamics of neurons and uh, with the advent of new uh, voltage sensitive dyes as well, this is only going to get better. Um, uh, and just uh, back, uh, back a few months ago there was a Nature methods paper that showed actually calcium imaging of the entire uh, worm's body as it was moving around. And so there's very exciting uh, developments for us as we make better and better models and, and have better, better constraints here. Okay, so that needs to connect to a body. That was what's on the other side of the screen. And so um, we've taken effort in the project to actually break down the anatomy, the, the, the physical anatomy of the worm's body into a particle-based system uh, where we're able to describe the, the soft and elastic tissue of the worm um, in a way that allows us to build virtual muscles and have that pulling on a body. So uh, this is what that looks like. So this in, in uh, December of last year, we were able to uh, do kind of a first boot up of this, uh, of this sort of physical side of the system. Now this is just a simple sinusoidal input going into the, the muscle cells of the, of the C. elegans, but um, it, what it's doing here is sweeping away liquid in the back 
um, as you can see here, sort of a thin sheet of, of those blue particles as sort of a liquid gel. Um, and to sort of reproduce at least a, a minimal amount of swimming and crawling behavior um, that starts to approximate what we can see in the, in, the real, in the real worm. So with this kind of a setup now, we're poised to be able to um, not only close the loop of connecting the nervous system to the body, but also closing the loop with the data sets, which is to extract the skeleton from here the same way that we can with the real worms and compare and make sure that we're uh, getting an accurate uh, metric for improvement. Okay. So now switching over a little bit to the open science side and the social media side of the talk. So um, uh, this book here, Reinventing Discovery, I think is, is uh, I'd really recommend it to anyone curious about open science. It really takes some of these ideas of open collaboration and applies it to the scientific realm. Um, so uh, on the open science side for open worm, um, so we're an international open science community. Um, here's some at a glance uh, statistics of uh, places that we're up and, and things that we have. We do a lot of our work on GitHub, so we really are putting out um, our code uh, in the public sphere. Uh, so for anybody to see, there's a bunch of different repositories, there's a lot of different things that are going on uh, within the project all the time. Um, we also host uh, our meetings online using uh, streaming tools like uh, Google Hangout. Um, so we have, I think our total collection now is about 100 uh, different, uh, different meetings, not only of our own um, development such that other, so that other folks can see what's happening in the development of the community, but also uh, journal clubs. So you'll hear from uh, Shrijoy and Rick, who've actually both done uh, Open Worm Journal Clubs in the past. Um, and those are then get archived for all time so folks can see what's happening in, the, in that community. Um, and, uh, and so then a couple of vignettes. There's a lot going on in the community, but two things that I wanted to highlight are especially relevant to us here. So um, INCF graciously sponsored uh, uh, students uh, from the Google Summer of Code project. This is where Google um, funds in sort of internships for uh, students to come from around the world uh, to work on open source projects. Um, we, uh, we worked with two different students uh, this, this summer who successfully completed projects um, and, uh, and they're listed up here. Um, one working on Geppetto, which I'll talk about later, and the other working on a project related to sort of the semantic area of understanding uh, C. elegans anatomy. So um, that's one way in which we've been, I think, increasing the group of people coming into this area, so people who otherwise would not have interacted with computational neuroscience or neuroinformatics or now have a way to come in because the code is open. Um, and a second thing that we're sort of excited about is that uh, we use the crowdfunding platform Kickstarter to get out to about 800 people who, uh, who backed us. Some of you are actually here in the room. If, if you are, thank you. Um, uh, and here, um, the goal was really to, to take the YouTube video versions of what you see and really create an interactive application on the web that lets everybody play with the model uh, without installing anything. Because one of the things that we realize is that even just putting the code out still doesn't let people interact with applications. And so um, we wanted to ask the broader community if they'd be willing to uh, so sponsor us putting that up in a, in a more robust way and host it up on cloud services and let everybody have access to it that way. So that's currently under production and should be released uh, next June. Okay, and, and so then switching over to the open source uh, software engineering uh, side of things is the third part of the talk. Um, the, so when, when we started the project back in 2011, there were, it was really a nice collaboration between folks coming from the scientific community and also folks coming from the software engineering community who didn't really maybe know so much about biology. But as they got to understand the problem, they understood more and more the thing that we've seen repeatedly here um, over the course of this Congress and, and is a very common theme, the themes of, of multiple scales, uh, multiple algorithms, uh, and multiple time scales. And they set about to, uh, they wanted to really build a code base that could address that, a platform that could address that. And so this has started to take on a bit of a life of its own, which is why my slides change color here, into a project that we're now calling Geppetto, which is a sub-project underneath Open Worm, but is actually the source of, of like other collaboration and, and other folks, because this idea seemed to get catch on and, and become more popular even outside of uh, neuroscience or even outside of Open Worm. So the idea of it, it, it is a web-based a uh, simulator that um, on the front end is able to um, you know, have these advantages of just allowing URLs to link to models. And here's an example of, of that, uh, where we're running a simple Hodgkin-Huxley model, um, but it's being done on the web, and so you can check this out on your own laptops at live.gepetto.org. Um, but it's also able to run different algorithms at the same time, so you can click through and see, for example, simple uh, e examples of, a, um, of that particle-based uh, simulator that's able to simulate physical physics um, and, and combine them all together in a single platform. 
So um, why should you care? So access to simulators in a browser can aid collaboration and let lots of folks see um, what's going on. Um, allows you to visualize your models without uh, installing any software. And uh, it, it allows you to work with complex systems, as I said. But I think what's even more important about this, and the reason that I wanted to bring it up and highlight it here, was more than what that particular application is doing, because in fact, as again, again, it's just one of many of the code bases that we're working on under OpenWorm. It's the way it's being developed in order to create this bizarre kind of a, not bizarre, but bizarre um, uh, approach to, um, maybe it's a little bizarre, approach to uh, open science. So um, one is that all of, uh, all of the code bases, as much as possible, are under regular uh, tests. So that means that every time a new um, commit or like line of code is checked in to the system, it reruns a whole battery of tests, and the running of those tests is also public. So um, you know, everybody can see uh, when our tests pass, and everybody can see when our tests fail. So that's all very important for ensuring reliability. Um, and the other is uh, this, which is, um, is really making not just the code open, but the process of developing the code open. So this is uh, an example of a Kanban board where each one of those little cards there that you see are uh, in caps uh, capture either a bug or a feature request or an enhancement that somebody who's coming to this platform wants to build into it. And uh, through regular meetings every, every couple of weeks and through monthly releases, so every month a new version of this uh, code is, is put out, um, in fact, the whole process of putting this together is much more distributed, much more collaborative, um, and, and much more the bazaar rather than the cathedral. So that's kind of where I want to leave you here is thinking, uh, you know, about the notion of, you know, do, is what we're doing in, uh, you know, computational neuroscience or informatics a bit more of the cathedral, which was still describing something where uh, content was being divulged to the public, or what are the ways that we can start to bring it more decentralized and make it more of a bazaar? So from, uh, you know, all the way from, so hopefully today, what I, what I hope that you've gotten across is this idea of our approach, uh, that we're uh, using real data of uh, behavior, trying to close the loop of the nervous system, and attaching that with, uh, with a physical model of the, of the worm body, uh, to the uh, the open science approach where we're uh, really putting everything up on GitHub, uh, examples of that, uh, Google Summer of Code and, and Kickstarter, and finally really uh, carrying forward with an open source development project where we sort of featured Geppetto and an open process on GitHub uh, using an open development process. So uh, those are the folks involved in the project. Uh, is not, uh, it is the work of, of many folks, and uh, you can find out more about the project at openworm.org. Thank you. Okay, so um, we can have a few questions um, relating, if we focus on the talks and then as I say, we can discuss the more general philosophical points maybe at the end. Any specific um, uh, questions for, for Stephen? Um, I was wondering how many people have you been at the very beginning of the Open Warm project? Because I think there are many good projects out there which simply lack of the critical mass to to get the visibility and to get the the kind of um, yeah power that you need to to maintain this project. So how did the Open Warm initiative started, and how did you manage to to get such a big community? Uh, it began with four people uh, who met on Skype on a regular basis. It started um, by connecting. So I think the most important thing that we did at the beginning was that we started with people who already had a burning interest to try and do this simulation with the C. elegans, rather than finding people who had no interest in that and trying to get them to work together. So, um, so, uh, so there was a nice confluence of, of interest there, both from the folks who were building the physical models, the folks on the neuroscience side, or the folks on the software engineering side. And, and then we followed best practices in, in building open source projects um, like you know, putting a website up and bu building a mailing list, and uh, and grew it organically from there. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, first, I must say I'm very, very impressed that you have managed to build this kind of open community around this. Um, and I, as I understand it, whether researcher or student or non-scientist, if you can contribute, you're welcome. If I understand right. That's right. Yeah. Have you had any sort of negative pushback from? more senior researchers or, or from people's bosses or from funding people that you shouldn't be this open, that you should, you should keep it more close, keep the data close. Uh, have you had any problems like that? Um, so far, so good. We haven't had a uh, negative pushback. Um, 
we are, um, you know, we've, we've gotten one publication out. There's a second one that's currently in review. Um, that hasn't yet been a concern. Um, we have a few more that are in the pipeline. Um, so, so far, no, but uh, obviously, welcome to hear any, any suggestions or tweaks to it. Uh, quick question. Um, so, first of all, what are entry points for people who are interested in this? So, for example, if you have someone who uh, sees this open project and wishes to contribute, like how do they how do they get involved? How do they? I mean, it's it's good that it's all open and whatnot, but there need to be sort of like organized entry points for for people with different skill sets. So, how does that process work? And then, uh, my other question is, when you go to publish, uh, how many of those names do you have to put as as authors? Yeah, good question. So, uh, the entry point is the website, and depending on people's interests, they come in in a variety of ways. Um, often, uh, I'll ask them to sort of get a scheduled time with me to, to understand what they're interested in and to kind of funnel them into a part of the project that they're likely to succeed in to start off with. Um, but other sort of more um, decentralized ways that folks can get in are just by looking at the milestones and the issues that we post up on GitHub because we have kind of all of our little mini projects that we're doing um, posted there. And so folks can come in and see, well, hey, maybe I can help out with this piece of the project. We also do a lot to put documentation up so that folks can read and sort of digest and understand it. We're trying to constantly make that even better and better. So docs.openworm.org, for example, has a whole list explaining our modeling process and all that. So those are some entry points, um, but I, I think often the most effective is just kind of getting that person synced up uh, as part of an, a, another sub-project that's already going on and, and start talking to people. And the second uh, part of your question was, um, what was the second part of your question? Co-authors, yes. Um, so, as, so this has been an interesting thing, yes. Yeah, so um, as manuscripts get developed, often what we say is that in order to qualify as an author, you need to make some substantial, um, substantial uh, you know, um, modification to the, to the paper itself. So you need to have seen the paper, you need to know that the paper is happening, and uh, you need to have participated in its writing in some way, and that'll get you on the author line. And otherwise, if you've contributed to some code that's related, um, we'll, that'll be an acknowledgement. Um, so we'll put you in the acknowledgement section. That's so far, it's worked out all right. Yeah, um, about three or four years ago, there was a talk at SFN about how difficult it was to actually model C. elegans because the circuitry would change depending upon the hormones. And so I'm wondering to, to what extent um, the model of, of C. elegans in open worm is, is not just one model, but maybe a variety of models under different conditions and how you incorporate new scientific data into, into the information that needs to be modeled. Yeah, so the, the, you're talking about neuropeptides and the challenge of, of dealing with that. And I, I don't actually know, just I think this is a place where the field as a whole is limited. I, there's not a lot of published computational models, for example, that deal with uh, peptides anywhere, I think. Um, there's, there may be a handful of them. Um, so we want to incorporate those as well um, in, into the space. But on the broader question of data, um, we do work with declarative descriptions of models like NeuroML, and we've been working to have a, a cleaner pipeline from data to models so that you can actually have uh, models that are generated from data that then once the data are improved or facts are added, it actually drives right into say a NeuroML model or drives into a, a different model of physics and that kind of thing. And really trying to automate that whole process. But yeah, I mean, you know, we, we are not any further ahead than the field as a whole, I'd say, in actually doing the modeling. We're trying to take the best that's happening in the field and expose it so that we bring more people into it. <laughs> 